Tonight we're going to talk about watching remote baseball games live before television, really. And what you see here is a crowd in Times Square watching the 1911 World Series. And there's thousands and thousands of people doing this. And what are they watching? Well, we'll discuss that in a little bit. But first, let's look at actual television. The first televised baseball games in the United States started in 1939. First, there was a college game. It was Princeton versus Columbia at Baker Field in northern Manhattan. And that was picked up by NBC. And then they moved their mobile unit over to Brooklyn. And on August 26, shot the Cincinnati Reds versus the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field. And um, since many people think that television was introduced at the 1939 World's Fair, it doesn't seem possible that there could have been anything earlier. But in fact, there was. The world's first televised baseball game was in 1931, and it was in Japan. And it was using a mechanical scanning system. So you can see the spinning wheel with the spiral of holes cut in it uh, that was used for electromechanical scanning. Not sure if anyone was actually able to see anything in the pictures, but it was done. And there's an even earlier idea for having baseball on TV. That was in 1928. This is one of the extension roofs on the old Bell Telephone Laboratories building in New York. Uh, it's now a building called West Beth, but it's still there. And uh, this was their supposed first tennis coverage. I like the guy wearing his three-piece suit holding the tennis racket. And over on the right, you can see the television camera apparatus. And again, it has a big, gigantic spinning wheel. Um, it was a 50-line system, so 50 holes cut in that spinning disc. And there was a Bell Labs engineer who, in 1928, said, well, you know, we could move this camera around. We could take it someplace like Niagara Falls, or we could even take it to the Polo Grounds, which was the main baseball facility in uh, New York City at the time. And so that was the first proposal for baseball on TV. So that was 1928. So what was this guy talking about? This is uh, Cleveland pitcher Bob Lemon, who was inducted to the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1976. And here's an excerpt from his Hall of Fame induction speech. He says, I was born in September. and My mother had to see the World Series at the old opera house in Redlands, California. And in those days, they didn't have babysitters. They had clothes baskets. So they put old Lem in a clothes basket, and they went to see the World Series. I was probably about six weeks old. Well, what did she watch the game on in 1920? Remember, he said that my mother had to see the World Series. Or how about this book? This is about the um, biggest scandal in baseball, the Black Sox of 1919. And uh, they threw the World Series and um, supposedly organized by the gambler Arnold Rothstein, although he was never uh, indicted or convicted of anything. But he lived at the Ansonia Hotel in New York. And according to this book about the scandal, Eight Men Out, uh, even though the game was being played in Cincinnati, Rothstein went to the Ansonia and he went there to see the signal that the fix was in. There was supposedly a certain signal of uh, ball being uh, moved a certain way that would indicate that the fix was in. And in the book, they talk about witnesses who were there and they said it was almost like being there, seeing this thing that was at the Ansonia, whatever this thing was. Or how about this New York Times story? Now, many of you probably know Joyce Kilmer primarily as a service area on the New Jersey Turnpike. Uh, he's also the person who wrote the poem Trees. Uh, Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. Um, anyway, he wrote a story in the New York Times about Sir James Matthew Barry changing rooms at the Knickerbocker Hotel in 1914 so he could spend many hours breathlessly watching the baseball game. Well, who is this person, Sir James uh, Matthew Barry? You might not be familiar with him by that name, but he's the person who wrote Peter Pan. And um, he was staying at the Knickerbocker Hotel. Now, the Knickerbocker Hotel was located in Times Square in New York. 
There is no ball field, even in 1914, anywhere in the vicinity of the hotel. So no matter which room he was in, no matter what window he looked out of, he could not have seen a baseball field. And yet, here is Joyce Kilmer writing that Barry changed rooms uh, so that he could spend many hours breathlessly watching the baseball game. And uh, let me expand a little bit on what he wrote. He said, spend many hours breathlessly watching the ball of light speed across the mimic diamond. Well, on the right is the mimic diamond that he was watching. It was something called the star ball player, and it was installed on the New York Times building, which was in Times Square. And there was indeed a ball of light moving around. I thought for a little while that maybe this was the inspiration for Tinkerbell in Peter Pan, uh, which was portrayed as a ball of light. But in fact, it was the other way around. Uh, Peter Pan was written before this point. Anyway, uh, there were twin births around 1845. One was baseball the uh, rules of baseball. Baseball goes back, the antecedents go back to the 14th century, but the rules of something that we would recognize as modern baseball with uh, 90 feet between the bases and um, three outs to uh, a side of an inning and so on were adopted by the Knickerbocker Baseball Club in 1945. And the same year is when uh, Samuel Finley Brees Morse, the uh, person who uh, worked on the telegraph in the United States, transmitted his message that said, what hath God wrought? So we have telegraphy and we have uh, modern baseball coming at about the same time. Um, the first sports bar appeared in St. Louis in 1875. Now, this picture is not a picture of the sports bar. This is a picture of the 1876 Democratic National Convention, which took place at the St. Louis Merchants Exchange Building. But about a block away and a year before, there was a place called Massey's Billiard Hall, and they arranged to get a telegraph line put in and for information about what was happening at the game to be transmitted on that line and then a telegraph operator would receive the information and would post the results on a blackboard and uh, that was considered the first sports bar because people would go there to play billiards and be able to look up at the blackboard and see what was going on at the game well very shortly after that we have even more dramatic things to watch occurring uh, that's why I have here It Begins, started in 1884 in Nashville at the Masonic Theater. There were three telegraph operators, and they came up with a plan. One would go out to the ballpark, and he would telegraph information about what plays were happening back to the theater. A second one would read the information about the plays, and then the third one, based on what was being read, would uh, move things around on a large board that had a picture of the field or a diagram of the field, and he would have name cards that he would move around showing which player had uh, gone to which base and so on. Well, this quickly became so popular that it outgrew the 900-seat Masonic Theater, and they had to move into the 2,500-seat Opera House in Nashville. In 1885, in Augusta, at the Opera House, they had their own system. So this is an article from The Sporting Life on the right side here. It says, we have a blackboard in the Opera House and a diamond on it with holes punched for each base with flags showing how each base runner gets his base with the batting order of each nine. The whole game is sent by telegraph showing how each player plays. They charge 10 cents for each day. We've gotten the games played by our nine in Atlanta, Chattanooga, Memphis, and Nashville, and we'll get Columbus and Macon. Well, in Atlanta, they did something a little bit different. The headline down at the bottom left, that's from the Atlanta Constitution in 1886. At uh, DeGive's Opera House, they hired young boys and put them in uniform and had a small ball field on the stage, and the boys would reenact the plays based on the information that came in. But it was that system that started in Nashville that really got popular, and later in 1886 it had expanded to Boston, Chicago, Cincinnati, and Detroit. And 
Here is a story that appeared in the Detroit Free Press in 1886. By this point, they had gone to a giant backdrop and uh, they would have spotlights. And when there was a fly ball, the spotlight would project a little picture of a fly. Um, but also the language changed a little bit. So the person who was reading the things would not only read, but he would hit two pieces of wood together to make the sound of a bat hitting a ball, the and um, then he would make dramatic, uh, um, a dramatic description of what was happening. So if there was a fly ball, so we have something like this, foul fly to left. The audience fairly held its breath, and when the next instant the operator called out, And out to white! There came such a storm of applause, just as such as is heard as at, on a veritable ball field. Um, so that's where the kind of language of sportscasting came from. Now the systems moved outdoors starting in 1888. This is a system that was put on Joseph Pulitzer's uh, New York World. You can sort of see a little diagram of the ball field in the center of the picture. And a crowd of 6,000 gathered and this was on the uh, approach to the Brooklyn Bridge and so it blocked traffic on the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, Pulitzer's secretary had encouraged one of the editors who came up with the idea for this to patent it. And the patent on this and then another system that I'll show you in a moment um, earned enough for him to buy a controlling interest in the Boston Post. So this was really a popular system. So here are the beginning improvements. The system on the left is from that first patent. This is the 1888 system, and it's basically kind of like that uh, blackboard that was described in Augusta in 1885. It's a uh, diagram of the field, and it has holes in it, and instead of flags, they stuck in pins, and the pins had different colors and names on them to indicate who the players were. The second patent, which was also used by Pulitzer's secretary uh, with the profits going to help him buy the Boston Post, was this one in the middle. And notice up by the uh, runs at the top, there are a couple of cranks and there are some dotted lines around the ball field. Well, those cranks could control the motion of the pins. The pins would actually move around the ball field and they could move individually. So you could have a fast runner uh, running to first base and a slow one moving more slowly between second and third, or maybe he was concerned about where the ball was or something like that. Uh, by 1891, electricity got added and um, the person who patented this system was also the first person to uh, say that we could probably cross the Atlantic by aircraft in about six hours. Now the next improvement was androids. On the left we have um, a system called the Little Men that uh, started in Richmond, Virginia and spread very quickly to many other cities. And then on the right, a system called Automatic Baseball by Electricity, which uh, you can see the kind of lines uh, on the catcher's mask and on the batter's bat. And it was said that in this system, when the batter connected with the ball, he would drop the bat with a, quote, sickening thud. Uh, close quote, and then the catcher's mask could go up if he had to catch a fly ball or something like that. And uh, notice the glove that the pitcher is holding and the catcher is holding seem to be a little bit on the large side. Um, that's because they had light bulbs, and so you could tell where the ball was at any particular time by which light bulb happened to be lit. Now here's a description that appeared in the Times in Richmond um, in 1895 of the Little Men. And the reporter says, one charming young girl was heard to say, aren't they just the dearest, cutest little fellows you ever saw and so polite? Why, they bow as sweetly as real live men when they're applauded. And another I declare I thought little Jake Wells looked positively handsome when he knocked that home run. Here's a, another story. Uh, this one appeared in the New York Times on June 5th, 1906. This is the entire story. 
Uh, Tom Johnson, in proposing to provide Cleveland with municipal baseball bulletin boards, emphasizes the rule that the people must have the urgent necessities of life, even if some of the luxuries are omitted. So this idea of being able to watch the games remotely was spreading very, very fast. Now on the left here I have some promotional materials for a uh, system from uh, Compton. At that time it was called the Compton Electric Baseball Bulletin. I'll tell you another name for it a little bit later. And uh, on the right I have an app that you can put on your smartphones called the Game Changer app. And I noticed quite a bit of similarities between the two. So not only did this uh, provide the language of sportscasting, it also provided um, some technology that may be used even today. Now here's a picture and story from the New York Evening Telegram uh, during the World Series of 1911. And remember that first picture I showed you was also from the World Series of 1911. These people are gathered in Herald Square and they're estimating the crowd at 70,000. And the other crowd that I showed you was in Times Square and that was a very large crowd also. This crowd happens to be watching a system called the Playograph uh, which, like Jumbotron, much later became sort of a generic term. People would use it, whether it was an actual playograph or simply some other system for watching uh, baseball remotely. Uh, so we have 70,000 people in Herald Square. We have maybe 50,000 people in Times Square. People are also watching in armories. People are watching in Madison Square Garden. Uh, and the crowd in the stadium where the game is being played, just a few miles away, is only 50,000. Here's some more innovations that occurred in the period 1908 to 1913. By the way, between 1889 and 1927, 44 U.S. patents were issued for various systems for watching uh, games remotely. At the uh, upper left there, I'm showing the playograph again. I'll show you a little bit bigger pictures of some of these. In the middle, the Jackson Mannequin. The uh, bottom right is the Noakes Electroscore, which is one of the systems that was popular but wasn't even patented. And then the other two corners are the uh, Coleman Lifelike Scoreboard. So here's the Playograph. And um, one of their pride and joy uh, features was that the ball was a regulation baseball. And you can see a little perspective put into the field and there were wires connected to the baseball and so it could move exactly wherever it went and supposedly at the same speed and the same kind of motion and so on. And then all the other information being presented. Uh, this is the star ball player. This is the one that um, Barry was watching at the Knickerbocker Hotel. And you can see it also has some wires connected to its ball and some other technology. Scientific American ran a story in 1913 on many of the systems. Here is the Jackson mannequin from Scientific American in 1913. Again, these mechanical ball players in this case running around the field. Uh, this is the backstage view of the Coleman lifelike scoreboard, which used 400 projectors to show the players running around the field and various other things that were going on. And then here is the front view, what the people saw in the theater. This is at the National Theater in Washington. And you can see uh, down at the bottom right, the at-bat showing a picture of a player. So they would have different players who would be in there with different slides. Um, here is the Noakes Electroscore, and um, the pride of this system was that it had 1,500 light bulbs in the infield, and they would light up to show the path of the ball, which way it was going. And here is a, just a small column that was in the Washington Herald on June 7th of 1914, showing five different theaters just in that one city using five different systems to present remote baseball games. People who went to the theaters paid money and people who stood outside the newspaper offices didn't, but of course the newspapers got credit for putting up their systems. There were many different names for these systems. I mentioned before the star ball player, the playograph, 
Uh, there was the champion baseball player, the Noakes Electra score, the standard ball player from New Bedford, Massachusetts. The reason it was called standard was because it was started by somebody who worked for the standard, which was a newspaper there. But some of the other names I found uh, really cute, the Chapman Automatic Baseball by Electricity, the Coleman Lifelike Scoreboard, and this is one of my favorites, the Compton Electric Baseball Game Impersonator. And then there was Crowder's Little Men, Grover's Electric Marvel Playing Board, uh, the Jackson Mannequin Baseball Indicator, May's Electro Wonder Scoreboard, and uh, another cool one uh, that was not patented but was very popular, the Rodier Electric Baseball Game Reproducer, which drove Atlantic City wild. Now, in 1921, there were some stories about these systems, and one of the unusual things was that the story said that people actually preferred, in some cases, watching these systems to being at the ballpark itself. So Haywood Brune, reporting in Vanity Fair, uh, talked about a conversation between two newsboys he saw at the polo grounds who are, you know, they're right there. They're at the ball field. They're watching the game. And one says to the other, gee, what would you give to be in Times Square right now? And the New York Herald ran an editorial saying that watching an actual game is tame by comparison. And they talked about how um, their player graph poured kerosene on your imagination and sparked it into a big conflagration. Um, these things weren't just in big cities. Here is a system in Muncie, Indiana in 1923 and in Laramie, Wyoming in 1925. And um, down uh, towards the bottom on the left, there's a system from Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. Now, this is very interesting. It's a little tiny town. They couldn't even afford the telegraph lines, so they would listen on the radio and figure out what was going on in the game from that. And a couple of local electricians built a board for them, and that's the one that's shown here. It's actually in the collection of the um, National Baseball Hall of Fame and, and, and Museum. And on the left, showing that this continued into the 1930s, is an ad that appeared in the Arizona Daily Star in Tucson saying you can watch today's baseball game at the Opera House. So this is in a theater, and you can be nice and comfortable. Um, and it's paid for by the uh, Arizona Daily Star and the Opera House, so you don't have to pay anything to go see that. Here's a system that was at Walter Reed Army Hospital in 1918. So uh, these systems were almost ubiquitous. It, if you talk to somebody about watching a baseball game in the uh, 1910s or 1920s, everybody would know what you were talking about. But then everything changed. And it really started in 1920. Um, the, at the Army-Navy game, a baseball game that was uh, played in May of 1920, the Navy wanted to try out some new facilities, and so they had an operator with a radio telephone at the game, and he would call the plays on that. And it didn't go very far. It just went to a nearby communication center, but there it was converted to uh, code and transmitted worldwide, so people in Guam could uh, follow the game based on the uh, code transmissions. Um, the next year, we have a game that's actually announced by Radio Voice, and the announcer is this guy on the right. This isn't at the ballpark, but he went to Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, where uh, the Pirates were playing Philadelphia, and they defeated them 8-5 to five on August 5th, 1921, and he dutifully um, speaks into the microphone whenever there's a pitch and says, what happened? And then he shuts up. And so there's dead air because baseball is a game that is large periods of not much happening, uh, followed by a few moments of excitement. And he later said, nobody told me I had to talk between the pitches. And so people actually didn't like listening to live coverage of the game. They much preferred reproduction of the game, very similar to that uh, stuff that I was talking about in Detroit, where they would hit two pieces of wood together uh, for the sound of the bat hitting the ball, and they could make crowd noises, and so on. And uh, so here's a famous uh, baseball game recreator. 
Um, you might know him for a different thing he did, being president of the United States, but Ronald Reagan would recreate baseball games on the radio uh, from 1934 to 1937. He did it at WHO in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. And... Um, these recreators were dependent on the information coming in by telegraph lines, and every now and then the telegraph lines would fail. But they couldn't have dead air, so they had to keep things going. So one of the things that Reagan would do would be he would keep making foul balls. Oh, there's another foul ball. Oh, it's amazing. How many foul balls is he going to have? Oh, another foul ball. This would go on until the telegraph lines would be restored and he could find out what was going on and then he would catch up the game. So eventually radio um, took over. Um, in the mid-1930s, some Newspapers tried combining radio with their uh, visual systems. Um, the visual systems continued, as I mentioned, into the 1930s. But here's a picture from Montrose, Colorado in 1939. And there's not a lot of people taking a look at the board because radio was available by this point. But this is 1939. And 1939 is when television started taking over. And so we have continuity of being able to watch remote baseball games live starting in 1884 and continuing uh, to the present day.